Families often have conflicts or financial problems, but there are also families who manage to stick together and make it through everyday life. It's pretty clear which one is happier, don't you think? My name is Rachel. I've been called an oddball since I was a child. I don't know what's different about me. I just know people say I'm different. Being called different isn't the problem. The real issue is being ignored by my own parents. This led to a lonely childhood for me. I've always been sensitive to people's emotions and can somehow understand what they're thinking. I don't know why I can do this. It's not like I can always see or feel it, but it's as natural to me as moving my hand or breathing. I found it strange and couldn't understand why others couldn't do the same. There was a time when I felt a bad vibe from a colleague my father brought home from work. I warned my mother to be careful with that person, but she didn't listen. Later on, that colleague tricked my father into signing a contract as a guarantor for a loan. Although my mother didn't take my advice, when my father stepped away from the table with his colleague, I told him, Dad, something is telling me that the word joint is dangerous. I don't know what joint means, but please be careful. So, my father hesitated and refused to sign as a joint guarantor. Thanks to that, when my colleague went bankrupt and couldn't repay the debt, my father was able to avoid taking on all the debt. Another day, when I was shopping with my mother, I felt a wave of discomfort coming from behind us. When I turned around, I felt this bad feeling coming from a man wearing sunglasses and a hat. I said, Mom, let's take that side street. I grabbed my mother's hand and moved to the side street. My mother was confused and asked what was wrong, but just as we moved, we heard someone shout, Thief, from the street we had been on. The man with the bad vibe had snatched a woman's purse and ran off. The woman fell and got hurt badly. If we hadn't moved to the side street, the man's target would have been my mother. Things like this happened often, and people started to think I was strange and mysterious. My parents began to avoid me, and I felt lonely and isolated. What seemed normal to me was not normal to others. I started keeping my thoughts to myself. I stopped expressing my feelings because I knew normal people don't feel what I feel. If I didn't say anything, they wouldn't think I was weird. I would just be like a normal kid. I have a sister, Julie, who's four years younger than me. Unlike me, Julie is a regular kid. As the years went by, I became more withdrawn, but Julie just got cuter and more charming. It was clear who everyone preferred. Our parents started to favor Julie over me. They would say, Julie is such a lovely girl, but Rachel seems to be a bit on the darker side. They noticed I had become less odd lately, but still thought I was different. What they called odd was me not talking about things only I could sense. It was my way of dealing with the world. I was tired of how this ability of mine was torturing me, so I tried hard to suppress it. I wondered if my attempts to hide myself and appear normal were making me seem abnormal, or if once labeled as the odd kid, that image just couldn't be erased. I grew up without much love from my parents. On the other hand, Julie received all the love, including what should have been mine. Julie, who was spoiled and pampered, sensed our parents being cold and distant toward me. She started to look down on me. I don't like being around you. Your gloominess rubs off on me. I'm so cute, but your loner image brings me down. Julie started to insult me whenever she got the chance. Our parents lightly scolded Julie, but they never seriously tried to correct her. When I was in 8th grade and Julie was in 5th grade, she was scouted by a talent agency on the street. I knew it. It's because I'm cute. They said I could even appear on TV, Julie said, pleased with herself. She started dreaming big, and our parents didn't seem entirely against it. You should calm down and think carefully. I sensed something shady about this. I spoke up, expressing the intuition that I had long suppressed because I didn't want Julie to get into trouble. Julie, who didn't know about my unique ability, said, What's your problem? Are you just jealous because you're not cute and nobody approached you? Don't say weird things and stop interfering with me. She seemed furious, 
Even my parents, who knew about my ability, either forgot about it or were too excited about Julie standing on the glamorous stage. They sided with Julie and criticized me. After that, I resolved to remain silent again. I told myself that there was nothing good in saying unnecessary things. One day, a student teacher came to my junior high school. He was a male college student who graduated from the school and wanted to be a physical education teacher. As he shared his dreams about education and gave a strong greeting, the teacher and students, especially the female students, were charmed. When he responded cheerfully to the girls' excited cheers, I sensed a dark aura from him. I had always vowed to hide my unique abilities, but seeing my classmates potentially in danger, I decided to break my self-imposed rule. I chose a teacher who seemed understanding and talked to her. I know this is sudden, but please believe me and help me, I said. The teacher was puzzled by my sudden request, but agreed to stake out a certain location after school, just as I asked. I didn't tell the teacher the details. I had no reason to think she would believe me, but the fact that she agreed to help without any explanation made me think she wasn't an ordinary person either. The next day, the school was in an uproar. The male student teacher was arrested for violating a public nuisance prevention ordinance. The location where the teacher staked out was near the girls' restroom. Within 10 minutes of starting the stakeout, the student teacher appeared, entered the girls' restroom, and installed a video camera. The teacher caught him in the act. Thanks to that, the female students were saved from being secretly filmed, and their dignity was protected. Meanwhile, my sister, who had joined the talent agency, was proudly telling everyone about it. But there were no real lessons or auditions, she only had to pay expensive membership and lesson fees. Then, suddenly, the agency closed down, leaving an empty shell. In short, my sister was scammed. She cried and screamed, directing her anger at me. It's all because you said weird things. My future is ruined, and it's all your fault. It didn't make any sense, but my sister seemed to truly believe it. Maybe that's the only way she could handle it. For me, it was a disaster and a nuisance. Our parents didn't say such unreasonable things, but their attitude became more distant toward me and more supportive of my sister. I ended up feeling lonely again, as the odd one out. I was happy that I could help everyone at school, but I was terrified that my actions would corner me. That's when I received a call from the teacher who had listened to my story, asking me to come to the staff room. Worried that I would be labeled as strange again, I opened the door to the teacher's staff room. You knew something like that was going to happen, didn't you? The teacher asked me in a low voice, without any preamble. Thinking there was no point in pretending, I gathered my courage and told the teacher about my mysterious power. I thought so. I know there are very few people like you, the teacher said. For the first time, someone showed understanding for my situation. The teacher said they knew someone with a power like mine, and that's why they could understand. Actually, that person is my aunt, and I've been listening to her stories for a long time. You must be worried about a lot of things because of your power. Maybe getting advice from someone who's been in your shoes will help clear your mind. Saying that, the teacher introduced me to the person. The person looked at me with kind eyes and said, It's natural to be worried, but you don't need to suffer. I was drawn to their gentle yet deep eyes that seemed to see through everything. The person's name was Hannah, and she had the same kind of power as me since she was a child. She had experienced a lot of struggles and hiding herself throughout her life. The stories from my senior who had gone through the same experiences helped me release my worries and doubts. From this day on, my interactions with Hannah began. I called Hannah my mentor, but she just gave a wry smile and said, please don't. Thanks to Hannah, or rather my mentor, I changed. I had been living my life quietly, trying to stay unnoticed, but as my awareness grew, I gradually began to live a normal life as an ordinary girl. However, since the incident with the talent agency, I haven't been able to reconcile with my sister. If anything, it feels like we're drifting apart. 
it's become normal for her not to talk to me, and when she does, it's just to complain or insult me for no reason. I often have no idea what triggers her mood switches. My power couldn't predict my sister's emotional changes either. Just because you got into college doesn't mean you're all that. It's not even that great of a school, and you're so happy-go-lucky, she would say. My sister, who had hoped to get into her top-choice high school, ended up at her second-choice school. Because of that, she got mad when I got into my first-choice college. It's not like I bragged to her, she just dissed me because of her own frustrations. Our parents only tried to appease my upset sister and kept their distance from me, as if telling me to stay away from her. It seemed that my sister didn't like the fact that I had become brighter since meeting my mentor. To my sister, I had to be a dark and gloomy girl who was inferior to her. But my sister is really smart. It was surprising that she failed her high school entrance exams. Of course, she was filled with frustration and poured all of that into studying at her new high school. As a result, she was at the top of her class for all four years and got accepted into a prestigious national university on her first try. I got into the most difficult university. Your college doesn't even come close to mine, she boasted. I lightly responded with, that's true to my satisfied sister because I knew nothing good would come from getting too involved with her. However, my sister thought that my light reaction was belittling her accomplishments and unleashed a barrage of verbal abuse at me. Both my parents were at their wit's end with my sister, who couldn't be calmed down once she lost her temper. All they could do was watch nervously. They blamed me for causing the trouble and eventually ended up calling me a troublemaker. I wanted to argue back about who the real problem child was, but I always swallowed my words to avoid complicating things further. Setting aside my sister's issues, as I approached college graduation, I had to seriously confront my own career path. I was no longer as introverted as I used to be. I still struggled with socializing and had little confidence in building good relationships with others. My ability allowed me to detect people's negative emotions. While I could sense positive emotions too, it seemed people were more prone to negative ones, which made detecting such negativity painful for me. Throughout my school life, I was tormented by these swirling negative emotions and had come close to losing faith in people. Could someone like me really manage to work at a company? I decided to consult my mentor about this dilemma. I wanted to learn how she had overcome similar issues as I was sure she had faced them as well. I have experienced the same worries as you. Maybe you should consider doing the kind of work I do, she suggested. My mentor used to work as a fortune teller and a counselor, helping people resolve their problems. She could use her abilities to their fullest extent and contribute to the world and people around her. Also, she was able to work freelance, which meant she didn't have to belong to any organization. This way, there were fewer chances of getting entangled in human relationships or being affected by other people's emotions. It's the perfect job for people like us, she said. Encouraged by my mentor, I decided to pursue the same line of work. She taught me everything from how to do the job to how to acquire clients. Nowadays, thanks to the internet, it's possible to work from home without any issues. When I told my parents and sister that I would not seek employment after graduation and work from home instead, they responded, What's that? What kind of job is that? Seems so dumb. You'll be home all the time. At least make sure to do the housework. Can you even make a living doing that? How will you cover living expenses? Well, as long as you contribute to the household, do whatever you want. While I expected such a response from my parents, it made me feel a little lonely that they didn't support me more. I felt sad thinking about their demands for housework and money. My mood darkened, and so my life working from home began. At first, I didn't have any job requests and struggled day by day. But with my mentor's help, I gradually got the hang of it and started to make a living. For about a year, I couldn't contribute financially to the household, so I focused on doing the housework. My dad seemed unsatisfied, 
but my mom was relieved and kept him in check. After about a year, when I finally started contributing financially, my dad mocked me by saying, Oh, finally, you're able to earn some pocket change, huh? But I could tell he was actually quite satisfied with the money. However, even though I was contributing, the amount of housework I had to do didn't decrease, and our lives remained unchanged. Then, after another three years, my sister graduated from college and secured a job at a foreign company. Unlike you, I'm an elite. You're just unemployed, living at the bottom of the barrel. It's so depressing to have you as a sister, she would say. My sister, who had successfully landed a job, started to belittle me for working from home. What are you even doing working from home? That's just like playing. You're nothing more than a parasite living at home. At times, she'd say, it's really weird not to work outside. I'm working hard, earning everyone's respect, and now I've been promoted to teen leader. My pay is going to increase, and I'm probably earning about five times more than you. There's no way a homedy like you can earn that much. My sister, who was promoted to teen leader after only a year and a half at the company, kept one-upping me and looking down on me. She boasted about her good salary, but hardly contributed any money to the household, and didn't help with the chores at all. Laundry, cleaning, preparing meals, everything was dumped onto mom and me. When I say mom and me, mom mostly left it to me, so I was basically doing everything. Whenever I said to her, Julie, you should take care of yourself a little. You shouldn't just spend all your money on fun. You should contribute to the household too. She just dismissed me, saying, you, the unemployed, can handle the chores. I'm saving my money for my future. Our parents also just let her do what she pleased for some inexplicable reason of, it's Julie, it can't be helped. I was used to my current lifestyle, and it was a comfortable environment for me to work, so I wanted to keep it that way. But I was starting to consider how to take care of myself. Then came the bombshell announcement from my sister. Without any prior warning, both our parents and I were taken aback as she continued. He's a real elite with an annual income. She sneered at me and added, Marriage is just a pipe dream for someone unemployed like you, isn't it? She said she would bring her boyfriend over the next Sunday. With the rapid succession of sudden developments, Sunday came, and we were still reeling. The man my sister brought along looked like a successful young man, impeccably dressed in a sharp suit. Nice to meet you. My name is Jack, he said. I would like to ask for your permission to marry Julie, Jack said, greeting us properly and showing good manners. Isn't he wonderful? Just as I said, I'm going to be so happy with this man, Julie gushed. So Jack, what do you do for a living? Dad managed to ask, clearly impressed by Jack's presence. Yes, I'm currently training at a company that my father knows, Jack replied. We were puzzled by the word training, and then Julie said gleefully, his father is the president. He's training now to take over the presidency in the future. My sister seemed over the moon about becoming a future president's wife. Afterward, we had various conversations, and Jack left stylishly. There were a few things that made me raise an eyebrow during the conversation, but my parents were thrilled with the high-status man. However, I felt an inexplicable dark shadow from that seemingly refreshing and good-natured man, Jack. It was something only I could sense, so I didn't know how to explain it. I could no longer remain silent, fearing that marrying a man with hidden issues would make my sister unhappy. Julie, you've only been dating him for less than four months. You might want to understand him a little more before deciding to get married, I cautioned, driven by a strong gut feeling. Sis, he's an elite and a future CEO. You won't find anyone better than him. Oh, I see, you're jealous, aren't you? You're bitter because you're comparing your life to my happy one. Poor jobless sis, she retorted. Even our parents got angry at me for interfering with Julie's happiness. You're just unemployed, so at the very least, stop interfering with your sister's happiness, they said. 
It was clear that our parents were hoping to secure a comfortable old age by marrying Julie off to a wealthy man. Frustrated by my inability to effectively communicate my concern about the dark shadow I sensed looming over Julie, my head was spinning. In the meantime, the two got engaged, and a meeting between both families took place. Jack's parents, like him, carried an air of freshness about them, but I felt the same ominous cloud hidden behind them. However, I was unable to convey this danger to my overjoyed sister and parents. Before I knew it, the day of the wedding had arrived. The CEO of our company is attending today's reception. Can you comprehend how much I'm appreciated and anticipated in my company? I guess it's a kind of honor that a shut-in like you wouldn't understand, my sister said gleefully before leaving the house. She always included some derogatory words directed at me. At the wedding ceremony held at a hotel, the couple who pledged eternal love to each other entered the reception hall. Watching my sister, who was beaming with joy, I worried about how long this happiness would last. As my sister mentioned, the CEO made a keynote speech, full of praise for her, which delighted her. Once the speeches were over, food and drinks were served to each table. There were all sorts of delicious-looking dishes, but I started to feel a sense of discomfort. Gradually, I realized that no dishes were being served in front of me. At first, I thought my meal was just late, but other tables were already being served drinks, appetizers, and so on, one after another. Clearly, something was off. Nothing was being delivered to me. People at the same table began to notice this oddity and started whispering among themselves. At that moment, my sister came over to me and whispered into my ear with laughter in her voice. We didn't prepare free meals for the unemployed. After all, it's such a waste to serve such food to a jobless person. You should just eat potato chips at home. Just leave your gift money and go home. This outrageous remark was spoken loudly in my ear, and my ears rang. Jack, sitting at the groom's table, was grinning and nodding. Even our parents, who at first seemed surprised, said, Well, it's true, Rachel is jobless after all. I was first taken aback, then a wave of anger surged up within me. I never thought you'd stoop this low, sis. Mom and Dad, this is unacceptable. How could you accept such rudeness? My parents just scowled at me, never bothering to reprimand my sister. Fine, I get it. I'm leaving, but don't come crying to me later, I said. You sound like a sore loser, she shot back. Amidst the chaos of this unbelievable turn of events, a man suddenly stood up. Sorry to interrupt, I'm the groom's brother, Larry. My brother and parents are trash but it seems the bride is even worse. I can't take it anymore, said the man who introduced himself as Larry. He continued, Dad, your company went bankrupt five months ago, didn't it? Pretending to still be a CEO is just a scheme to mooch off the bride and her family. Jack will never become a CEO. He's planning to leech off his wife while pretending otherwise. He's unemployed now. Larry's words caused a commotion among the guests but my sister was the most heated. What do you mean you lied to me? What do you mean unemployed? She demanded, her face turning from red to blue, her eyes welling up with tears. Our parents, their assumptions proven wrong, began to yell and curse. The anguished cries of my family echoed throughout the venue. The groom and his parents remained silent, looking sulky. Before the ceremony, I had received a confession and apology from Larry and asked him to speak his mind without reservation if something happened during the reception. As my sister was berating Jack with a wrathful face, another man couldn't take it anymore and stood up. It was the president of my sister's company. Enough already. This is embarrassing. You have no right to criticize the groom. What do you think about your terrible attitude towards your own sister? The president's angry voice made my sister's face contort in fear. For one, I didn't attend your wedding for your sake. I wouldn't have come if you weren't the sister of Rachel. Suddenly, my name was mentioned by the president, and my sister's eyes widened in surprise. Huh? Who are you talking about? 
Rachel is a goddess to many of us business owners, rescuing countless companies from the brink of collapse, he continued. In fact, with the guidance of my mentor, I have been working as an advisor for corporate revitalization and growth. Starting with fortune-telling and life consultation, I used my abilities to show companies the path they should take. All my advice was spot on, and the companies that sought my help experienced a rapid resurgence in business, achieving a V-shaped recovery. As a result, I had earned titles like teacher and goddess. My sister's company had also consulted with me five months ago, and thanks to my advice, it had been reborn as a stronger enterprise. The president, grateful for my assistance, attended the wedding today as well. I had no idea. You're not just a basement-dwelling unemployed nobody, are you? My sister said, finally realizing the truth. Thanks to my thriving career, her assumptions had been shattered. I now earn several times what you do. Despite contributing significantly to the household income, our parents never seemed to care about me. They thought that money was from Julie. Oh, we thought July provided that money. They said, misunderstanding the situation. There was no way Julie would have been contributing money to the house. The wedding reception turned into a chaotic scene and was called off. Naturally, all the guests were fully refunded their wedding gifts. I've already signed a contract for an apartment under my name. I can't afford it on my own, especially now that he's unemployed, my sister sobbed. Jack retorted, you're the one who signed the contract. I don't know anything about that. The wedding was a complete disaster, resulting from my sister's malice towards others. She may argue there were reasons for her behavior, but they didn't hold up. Afterward, Julie divorced Jack and claimed alimony. Since Jack was jobless and his parents didn't have much, she couldn't receive much alimony. She barely managed to pay for the wedding venue, let alone the apartment she had contracted. The place that was supposed to be their love nest was never occupied and was canceled. However, the debt didn't simply vanish and Julie found herself heavily burdened by loans. Moreover, her outrageous behavior at the wedding quickly became known among her colleagues leading to a rapid decline in her reputation. The CEO had no choice but to demote her. With no place left in the company and having lost her pride as an elite, Julie wanted to quit and run away, but she had to bear the embarrassment for the sake of loan repayment. She continued with a trivial job in a hardly noticeable basement storage room. Jack and his parents, who had failed in their plan to leech off Julie, were now scraping by with occasional day labor. Naturally, Jack's elder brother, Gary, had cut off all ties with his parents and brother. The parents quickly gave up on Julie when she hit rock bottom and tried to cozy up to me instead. To them, I said, I've had enough of being manipulated by you. I'm cutting ties. Goodbye forever. I declared this and moved out to start a new life in a newly rented apartment. They took in the fallen Julie, who was struggling to make ends meet. Julie's salary was drastically reduced, and she couldn't possibly contribute to the household expenses, of course. I stopped the money I was contributing to the house as well. Without my financial help and unable to lower their standard of living, our parents quickly became exhausted and struggled every day to make ends meet. They were panting and stressed, trying to maintain the lifestyle they had grown used to but without the necessary income, it became a daily challenge. On the other hand, my work was thriving. I was able to guide many companies and individuals in the right direction, using my abilities to help them succeed. My reputation grew, and more clients sought my advice. This success brought me a sense of fulfillment and financial stability. It felt good to finally be appreciated for my skills and to see the positive impact I was making on others' lives. After the wedding incident, I started dating Larry. He had been so honest and brave during that chaotic time, and we grew close. He recently proposed to me, and I accepted. If everything goes well, marriage could be in our future. Larry is a man of pure heart, with no dark shadows lurking within him. Unlike the people my sister had surrounded herself with, Larry was genuine and kind. 
I'm looking forward to building a happy life with Larry. Together, we dream of a future filled with love, mutual respect, and understanding. With him by my side, I feel a sense of hope and excitement for what lies ahead. We've talked about our plans, our dreams, and how we want to support each other in everything we do. As I reflect on everything that has happened, I feel a mix of emotions. I am relieved to have cut ties with my parents and sister, who never appreciated me. I am proud of the person I have become, despite the challenges I faced, and I am grateful for Larry, who has brought light and love into my life. Looking forward, I see a bright future. I am excited about the possibility of marriage with Larry and the life we will build together. With him, I know I will never have to hide who I am or feel unappreciated. Our love and partnership are based on honesty and mutual support, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for us. Paul, who was kind while we were dating, started to verbally abuse me along with his daughter, Teresa, after we got married. Despite their treatment, I continued to save for Teresa's college funds. Eventually, a college acceptance letter arrived, and we decided to celebrate, which also coincided with Paul promotion. When I returned home from shopping, I found garbage bags filled with my books and clothes left in the yard. In the bedroom, Paul, Teresa, and my mother-in-law were throwing my belongings into garbage bags. Hurry up and leave. We can't invite Grandma over because there's not enough room with you around, Teresa said. Exactly. We don't need a failure at Hawaii. We'll just take the college funds. Thanks. Paul laughed, shaking his shoulders. A bond dweller making $10 per hour. Get out, useless mother. Bye-bye, my mother-in-law added. Something inside me snapped then. I'll leave, I said. I went to the yard and carried the remaining garbage bags to the car. Sitting in the driver's seat, tears of frustration overflowed. I bit my lip and vowed not to let this be the end. Remember this, I am Kelly, a 53-year-old housewife. Twelve years ago, I met Paul, who was 44, through work. We got along well as we worked together. Paul, who was cheerful and bright, seemed dazzling to someone as introverted as me. When he proposed, I was flustered and wondered, am I good enough? During one of our dates, he revealed that he had a nine-year-old daughter, Teresa. I was surprised to learn he was divorced, but soon grew fond of Teresa, who was affectionate and innocent after meeting her nervously. Our modest wedding went smoothly, and our married life started off well. However, the happy days did not last long. I lost my parents to illness during my student days and was raised by my uncle and his wife, who ran a business, after accepting the proposal. I introduced Paul to my uncle and his wife after getting their blessing for our marriage. Next, we visited Paul's parents to greet them. When my mother-in-law learned that I was raised by my uncle and his wife, she seemed clearly displeased. Maybe because of that, she started to make snide remarks to me after we got married. She would come over unexpectedly to nitpick everything. Kelly, there was a hair in the corner of the stairs. The bathroom mirror is dirty. Don't you clean it every day? She would frequently scold. It's outrageous that you work even though you have a small child. These days, everyone works even with small children. I switched to part-time so I could be home when Teresa comes back from school. I gently objected. My mother-in-law glared at me. How dare you talk back to your mother-in-law, insolent wife. I never asked why they divorced, but I could guess it might have been because of her nagging. Come on, Mom. If both of us work, we can save up for Teresa's college funds sooner, Paul said. But as years passed, like his mother... Paul started to verbally abuse me as well. You come back from work halfway through the day, and this is the meal you prepare. Don't you care to comfort your tired husband? I'm sorry, but it's tough to prepare two side dishes every day besides the main, I replied. You just want to slack off. Everyone manages to do it, he said. My mother-in-law, who was a full-time housewife, Never used store-bought prepared foods and forbade me from using them as well. So I found time to prepare meals in advance late at night or on weekends when the family was asleep. 
just when I thought the issue was resolved, Paul started insisting on bringing lunch from home to save money, which of course I had to prepare, and he found fault with that too. The lunchbox contains frozen food, and the main dish is leftovers. You're cutting corners too much. Preparing all the small dishes from scratch is hard, I said. Don't talk back. You're the wife. You know I hate pre-prepared meals. Are you trying to annoy me? Paul raised his voice. No more frozen or ready-made meals from now on. But it's the wife's job to think about the family's health and prepare meals. Do you want to make me and Teresa sick? You're terrible, he continued. I'm sorry, I understand. I'll do what you say from now on, I replied. Arguing back would only lead to hours of nagging, so it seemed better to comply quietly. It meant less time for myself, but it couldn't be helped. I had a hobby that brought me joy. After Paul and Teresa went to bed, I would jot down ideas in a notebook, imagining what it would be like if those things existed. This hobby, which I kept secret from them, was a great stress reliever. As a child, I had received an award for a summer vacation research project, and this was a continuation of that interest. Dealing with complaints wasn't limited to my mother-in-law and Paul. Initially, Teresa seemed like an innocent and adorable child, but as she entered upper elementary school, she began to act selfishly. Her mood swings would dictate whether she was affectionate or demanding extra pocket money. Then she would insult me in front of her friends, ignore me, or worse. Being manipulated by Teresa's moods left me exhausted. Seeing Paul mistreat me, Teresa began to mimic him, finding amusement in it. It was a phase of adolescence, and from Teresa's perspective, I was just the woman Dad brought home. Resisting was natural. If she wouldn't warm up to me, I thought I should try harder to get along with her. I made efforts to understand Teresa's feelings without scolding her harshly for misbehavior. Even when she hurled insults, I didn't snap back, but calmly explained, it's not right to speak to someone older than you like that. I always attended school events and helped with homework after returning from work. Whenever Teresa was sick, I would take her to the hospital and take time off work to care for her. I had no experience in raising children, but I poured love into her because she was the child of the person I loved and raised her with all my effort. However, it seems my feelings didn't reach Teresa. As Teresa entered high school, she needed a lunchbox. Unlike Paul's volume-focused meals, the appearance and variety were important for a high school girl's lunch. I woke up at 6 o'clock a.m. every day, making the lunches with care. Put fried chicken in tomorrow's, I want a hamburger in mine, they would request, making it quite a challenge. Yet, they often came back with their lunchboxes untouched. When I asked why, they would say nonchalantly, I was in the mood for pasta today, or I passed by a store and suddenly wanted to eat bread. I woke up at six to make these. I wish you would at least try them, I said. Upon hearing this, both quickly became sullen. You change your mind about things too, don't you? Don't be so sanctimonious. It's annoying. A mother should naturally make lunches for her children. Teresa's hostile tone hurt me more than Paul's words. Sorry, I said. When I apologized, Paul became even more arrogant. Don't get cocky just because you made lunch. It's nothing special. You should be grateful we even eat it every day, he said. Their complaints about too many vegetables or the taste being too strong were the last straw. I felt more sadness than anger. Talking with Teresa and Paul always made me feel miserable. The promise of sharing household chores made at the beginning of our marriage was quickly abandoned. Even if we both work, you're home by the afternoon. That doesn't really count as working. We get home in the evening. It's only natural for the person with the most free time to do the chores. Paul said, I'm not free at all. By the time I finish cleaning and preparing dinner, the night is over, I explained, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. Even on weekends, when I asked if they would help, Paul and Teresa would either lay around with their phones, lying on the sofa, or lock themselves in their rooms playing video games. It was as if I didn't exist in their field of vision. Hey, old lady, make me some tea, 
Teresa would say, I want coffee. Bring it to the living room. I'm playing games with Teresa. Paul would add, Teresa still refused to call me mom, sticking with old lady instead. Could you help me a little after dinner? I have a meeting with the Women's Association. I finally spoke up. Paul clicked his tongue in annoyance. What? Let us rest at least on the weekend. You see we're playing, right? Do you intend to disturb our parent-child bonding? Oh, but you're a stranger, so it can't be helped, he said. The word stranger pierced my heart like a blade. What's with that face? Got a problem? Paul threatened. Who do you think allows you to live in this house? A disposable part-timer like you standing up to me is an 80 years too early. Faced with their attacks, I bit my lip and swallowed my complaints. Though Paul boasts as a middle manager in a small to medium enterprise, his income isn't impressive. He makes more than I do as a part-timer, but that's about it. Paul dominance might stem from controlling the finances. Before our marriage, I mentioned I'm not confident in managing finances. Then I'll handle it that way you can relax, he said. Fooled by his cheerful smile, I agreed to hand over my salary to him. He would allocate funds from our combined incomes for living expenses and Teresa's college fund. Despite his salary increasing over the years, our living expenses somehow decreased. Lately, I've been given only $10,000. Half goes to saving for college fees, and the rest covers food, daily necessities, and miscellaneous expenses. I need at least $5,000 more, and I want some pocket money for myself. Housewives don't need pocket money. Put the $5,000 for Teresa's education into the account first. I'll check every month, Paul said firmly. I stood my ground. Paul, you often buy luxury watches and brand name suits. You nag me about saving money and are stingy with it. You seem to give Teresa a lot of pocket money. Why can't I buy what I want? I desperately appealed to Paul. I work too. It's ridiculous to need my husband's permission to buy clothes or go to the hair salon. Both Teresa and I have our social obligations. You don't need to keep up with mommy friends. Dressing up is just a waste of money for you, Paul retorted. Teresa also joined in, looking pleased to participate. Children cost money. Stop complaining. Then I'll increase my working hours. The extra can be my pocket money, right? I suggested. Paul was shocked. That's out of the question. You can't even manage household duties perfectly as it is. What if you neglect them even more? Mom would definitely oppose it, he said, mentioning his mother. I gave up on arguing. It was difficult for someone as timid and inarticulate as me to stand up to the two of them. Yet I harbored a faint hope. Maybe if Teresa gets into college and enjoys campus life, her attitude towards me will soften. Seeing Teresa happily going to college with the money I saved, perhaps Paul would respect me more than before. But my hopes were dashed as easily as they were formed. When the heat of the day began to increase, Teresa's acceptance letter arrived. A few days later, Paul came home with news that made Teresa cheer. Dad, you're becoming a manager. That's so cool, Teresa exclaimed. I got the provisional notice, but now it's confirmed. My salary and bonus are going to skyrocket, Paul announced. I listened with a disheartened feeling. I knew not a penny would come my way. I was certain I would still be forced to economize as before. Yay, buy me an awesome bag to celebrate. Teresa said, of course, let's invite mom over tomorrow for a celebration dinner. Kelly, prepare a feast. All homemade, of course, Paul instructed. Watching Paul and Teresa call my mother-in-law, I sighed quietly. This time, it seemed like I might be able to spend some peaceful time without any snide remarks. The next day, I went to the supermarket to buy ingredients for steak and soup. Despite the rainy weather, Teresa and Paul were in high spirits from the morning. When I arrived home and got out of the car, I glanced at the yard and tilted my head in confusion. A garbage bag, open and beaten by the rain, was left out. It wasn't there when we left. A bad feeling washed over me as I approached the garbage bag. I was shocked. 
Inside the bag were my clothes. I quickly tied it up and entered the house to confront Paul and Teresa, only to find my mother-in-law's shoes at the entrance. Hearing noises from the upstairs bedroom, I rushed up to find Paul, Teresa, and my mother-in-law, cheerfully stuffing my books and clothes into garbage bags. What are you doing? I demanded. Oh, you're back. As you can see, we're throwing out trash. The old lady's stuff is all cheap, Paul said casually. As they continued their task, I snatched the garbage bag from them. Stop. Don't do this without asking me. It's okay. You're no longer needed, Paul replied. The two of them excitedly raised their voices at me, leaving me bewildered. We've already paid the entrance fee for college, right? And we've saved up the $870,000 for five years of tuition. Your role as an ATM is over. Amazing how you saved up with just a $10 per hour wage. It's all thanks to me forcing you to save, Paul said proudly. I stared at Paul, astonished. Why was he speaking as if it were his own achievement? Paul continued, full of pride, after kicking out the previous wife, I wanted to bring mom here, but first, we thought of saving up for college. Finding a submissive woman to save up would mean Teresa and I wouldn't need to save. You seem submissive enough and just right to double as a housemaid. But dad, you were wrong, Teresa said, puffing out her cheeks. She couldn't do the housework perfectly, and she lectured me even though she's an outsider. Totally useless. My mother-in-law glared at me in agreement. We married you, a parentless older woman. You should be more grateful to Paul instead of always complaining. The two surrounded me, saying whatever they wanted. So hurry up and leave. We can't have Grandma move in with you hogging the rooms. Exactly. We don't need a failed wife. We'll just take the money, Paul added, pushing the garbage bag toward me. The bottom dweller earning $10 per hour. Get out, useless mother. Bye-bye. Something inside me snapped. Then I'll leave, I said. I grabbed my valuables, transferred my clothes and books from the garbage bags to a suitcase, and left the room. Heading to the yard, I also moved the rain-soaked garbage bags to the car. Sitting in the driver's seat, tears of frustration spilled over. Paul never had any affection for me. To be treated as nothing more than a housekeeper in ATM, how much more could they belittle me? I was furious. Biting my lip, I vowed in my heart not to let this be the end. Remember this, I thought. Eager to escape from those two, I drove a short distance before pulling over to call my uncle without revealing too much. I poured out everything, and my uncle, furious, immediately arranged for an empty room in a single dormitory for me to use until I found a place to move. I decided to accept his kindness. Fortunately, only my clothes got wet in the rain, so I dried them at a laundromat near the dorm and carried them to my room. As I stored my clothes in the chest of drawers and organized my valuables, I began to feel slightly more at peace. During our relationship, Paul had been truly kind, and I believed I was cherished. Even after his attitude changed post-marriage, I kept telling myself, he's really a kind person. Things will go back to how they were. With Teresa, I thought we just needed time to get along, and with my mother-in-law, I believed it was natural for in-laws to clash. But faced with reality, I finally woke up. No matter how much I tried to make amends or the effort I put in, it was futile with people like them. They would pay for trampling over my feelings. First, I visited my uncle's company to ask for a referral to a good lawyer. I went to the city office to pick up divorce papers and completed various procedures. Eventually, I received a message from Paul stating, I filed for divorce. After I left, neither Teresa nor my mother-in-law bothered to call, perhaps enjoying their life without me. A month of peaceful days passed until Paul contacted me again. I was working on my computer when I saw his name on my phone screen and decided to ignore it. I had been expecting his call, but I was busy. I let it go to voicemail. Soon, Paul's tearful voice came through. Kelly, please answer the phone. Something terrible has happened. After the call ended, my phone kept ringing persistently. 
Hurry up and come out. Help us. It's going to be bad if it stays like this. He left crying messages on the voicemail and called like a man possessed. Eventually, I gave in and answered the phone. What do you want, Paul? I'm busy. Can you get to the point? Paul hesitated on the other end, taken aback by my sharp tone. Oh, well, I called Teresa's college, he said, sniffling. They said she has withdrawn her enrollment, so she is not a student there. What's going on? Exactly as they said, I replied matter-of-factly. I canceled the enrollment. The prep money's gone, but they refunded the tuition fees to my account, which helps a lot. Withdrawal. Don't make decisions on your own. Paul yelled. Poor girl. She worked hard to get into college. Oh, really? I said, unimpressed. I didn't know, Kelly mocked. With the allowance you gave her, she was busy going to nightclubs and rock concerts until morning. Hardly the behavior of a student. That, that is, Paul stumbled over his words. I've never seen her study once. So you chose a college where money would do the talking, right? She studied when you weren't looking. College isn't just about studying. You've taken away her chance to learn other things, Paul argued heatedly. Oh, my mistake. It could have improved her twisted character, right? I returned his statement with heavy sarcasm. Why are you doing this? Do you have a grudge against us? Paul asked, bewildered. She told me to get out, called me a useless mother. Who does she think made her college possible? How do you think I felt saving up all that money? I said. Holding on to such words, you're petty. Well, there's money in the account, right? Paul replied, Yes, I said, and the call abruptly ended. Sighing, I returned to my work on the computer. Less than an hour later, the phone rang again. Reluctantly answering, I was greeted by a frantic Paul screaming, Why can't I withdraw the money from your account? So you couldn't. I feigned ignorance. Paul started to rant and rave. I was refused at the bank. Of course, I changed the account holder's name. You can't just do that. Ah, no. Kelly, where are you? Paul's voice sounded desperate, almost begging. Without money, Teresa will have trouble enrolling in another college next year. Return Teresa's money. Return it. That $250,000 is, is my money. I scoffed at the absurdity. If you stop all the lavish shopping you do, you should easily afford your beloved daughter's college fees. Ah, Paul was flustered. I need money because I live at the bottom, so the soon-to-be manager or your beloved mother should take care of it, I said with heavy sarcasm. I'll have a better salary as a manager, but I'm drowning in debt. Mom's on a pension, Paul admitted hesitantly. Drowning in debt, I realized he didn't want his weaknesses known. Both mom and I are having a tough time, so please at least spare us the compensation, he pleaded. Tough hut, but I'll be claiming compensation properly later. Take care, I emphasized my point and hung up. The day after being kicked out, I went to the bank and changed the account holder's name, anticipating Paul might try to withdraw money upon learning of the college withdrawal. If Teresa had been serious about her studies, canceling her college enrollment would have been heartbreaking, but given her carefree lifestyle, it wasn't. I chose this route without hesitation. That night, I received a voicemail full of insults from my mother-in-law, which I promptly deleted. Later, through a lawyer introduced by my uncle, I filed for compensation from Paul. Predictably, he resisted. Paul accused, knowing I don't have money, demanding compensation is just cruel. Why should I even have to pay? I provided for Kelly, treated a failed wife kindly, and didn't even cheat. What's there to complain about? Running off with the enrollment money is outrageous. If anything, we should be receiving compensation from you. So, I thought I'd wait until Paul changed his tune. A few months later, I received a call from my sobbing mother-in-law. Kelly, please help, she said, her tone as imperious as ever. It seemed her character would never change. Long time no see. What's the matter? I asked leisurely, though I could guess the reason. They're telling us to vacate this house, she said. Well, it can't be helped. It's my house, after all. 
I replied. My mother-in-law gasped in surprise. Didn't Paul tell you? When I got a job, my aunt and uncle transferred this house to me. I invited Paul and Teresa, who were living in an apartment at the time, to live with me, so it's in my name. This is the first I've heard of it, she sounded dumbfounded. Is that so? Well, anyway, my uncle was furious when he found out I was kicked out and said he'd proceed with selling the house, so I'm going along with it. I'm not kind enough to let the people who kicked me out live there for free. So you're really going to sell it? She asked. Yes, there's a viewing this weekend, so please move out by then. I replied. That's impossible, my mother-in-law shouted. I was kicked out in 15 minutes from my own house. I said calmly. The sale of the house is already decided. It would cause trouble for the real estate agent and the viewers, so please move out soon. Is Paul there? I asked. Paul seemed to have been listening nearby and took the phone. What do you want? He said. I took a deep breath and replied in a low voice. Who do you think allowed you to live in that house? Paul was speechless. Ah, that's a relief. How does it feel to hear those words? Damn it, I'm not paying any compensation. See if you can get it. Paul yelled. I was told to discuss this through a lawyer. I said, exasperated. Paul continued to yell. You with your low salary, plan to leech off compensation. Pathetic, but I'm not paying a cent. Are you sure you want to be so confident? I asked. I said this with a mix of disbelief and annoyance. I have plenty of evidence. The abusive words you, Teresa, and your mother hurled at me are recorded and noted. While you forced me to economize, you squandered money on luxury goods. There's no escaping this. A mother saving for her child is natural, and a wife should obey her husband. That's right. If you have something to say, earn more than me, Paul retorted, both making a scene with their vulgar attitudes. Return the college funds, thief. If you really don't, we'll sue you. Suit yourself. Enough, both of you. Teresa tried to calm her mother and Paul over the phone. I'm really angry at her for stealing my important college funds. That's the lowest a parent can get. Teresa, you are right. You are looking forward to college so much. It's heartbreaking. Paul's voice sounded like he was on the verge of tears. But it's okay. There's next year. If dad becomes a manager, our salary will increase and life will get easier. That's true. Paul shouted with apparent joy. So let's stop begging her. Let's quietly move to an apartment and hand over the house. If Teresa says so, my mother-in-law muttered in a reluctant tone, be grateful for Teresa's kindness. All right, I'm hanging up now, I said, exasperated, ending the conversation. The next call came the following day while I was having coffee in my uncle's company room. I could easily guess it was about the same matter, Reluctantly, I answered, no one ignoring them might lead them to show up at the company. What have you done? Paul was sobbing, sniffling, and with a voice like a scream, he asked. My promotion was canceled and I was demoted from manager to regular employee, sent to a subcontracting factory. What's going on? I sighed deeply. It seemed he still didn't understand anything. You know Acme Industries, right? Of course. It's a super famous discount store chain that's expanded overseas. It's also a major client of our company. You've injured its chairman. Huh. Paul sounded dumbfounded. He was actually planning to end the business with your company but reconsidered out of respect for me so your company wouldn't suffer. You should be thankful you weren't fired. I don't even remember meeting the chairman. The chairman of ACM is my uncle. After a brief silence, Paul screamed in shock. I moved the phone away from my ear to wait it out. You shouldn't have told me sooner. My uncle introduced himself during our marriage meeting. I replied. I was amazed by Paul's lack of attention. He stopped crying and suddenly pleaded, Come on, mediate for me. It's just a little marital spat. If I become a regular employee, my salary will decrease and Teresa won't respect me anymore. No, you brought this upon yourself, I said coldly. Is that all? I'm hanging up. What the hell? Acting all high and mighty when you're just a bottom dweller, 
he shouted. Just then, someone knocked on the door. Excuse me, President. Oh, I'm sorry, I said. It's fine. I'm about to hang up, I replied, smiling. Ah, I haven't told you. I'm the president of ACMA. Huh. The one with annual sales of $700 million. To be precise, the president of the American branch. Paul fell silent. I could almost imagine his shocked expression. That's a bad joke. Weren't you earning $10 per hour just a while ago? The salary slip you found in the bedroom? Look at the date. It's from 12 years ago when I first helped out at my uncle's company. I explained, trying not to laugh. I kept it as a keepsake. The minimum wage has surpassed $14 now. You really are clueless about America's economic situation. Paul, lost for words, soon spat out a resentful remark. Quiet but lucky. You have a rich relative. Even a useless mother can become a president. Do you think the position of president just falls into your lap because you're a niece? I've been developing product ideas for a while. Some of them were approved in ACMA's planning meetings and became hit products. I was recognized for those achievements. You were doing all that behind my back, he asked. Do I need your permission for everything? I sighed. I wanted to help my uncle, so I studied business management in college. A few years ago, at his request, I started attending board meetings and management seminars. It's the result of my effort. Paul fell silent again. Teresa's college expenses were covered by the royalties from a patented stationary product I developed. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to manage living expenses and savings for my salary alone. If you have money, then we don't need compensation, my mother-in-law interjected. It seemed Paul had put the phone on speaker so my mother-in-law could listen in. Teresa might be listening too. I learned recently that there's property division upon divorce, right? You're obliged to give half of what you earn to Paul, my mother-in-law said confidently. I couldn't help but laugh. What's so funny, mother? Property division is not an obligation but a right each spouse has. One can also choose to waive it, I explained. I could almost see my mother-in-law tilting her head in confusion over the phone. I'm refusing it, so not a penny will go to Paul. We can take it to court if you like, but I'm sure I would win. What? Mom becomes the president of Ackman and I get nothing. That's so unfair, I heard Teresa's disappointed voice. Paul remarked, Kelly, being the husband of a president means you can live in luxury. Forget about pride. This isn't the time, my mother-in-law urged Paul. Paul also agrees, right? Mom Kelly, I apologize for everything. Let's start over. I won't treat you as a housekeeper anymore, Paul pleaded. Mom, I won't call you useless anymore. So come back. I want a high-rise condo for our next home. Faced with their outrageous demands, my laughter turned into disbelief. I can earn well on my own, so I don't need a useless husband. Compensation will be deposited into my account monthly. If you can't pay, your assets will be seized. Take care. Amidst their shouts over the phone, I hung up and blocked Paul, Teresa, and my mother-in-law's contacts. Paul, who had been showing off at the subcontracting company, ended up being fired after causing trouble. Struggling with living expenses, debt, and compensation payments, he now works nonstop at a factory on weekdays and a restaurant on weekends. Of course, they had to move out of the house and now live in a rundown apartment with Teresa and my mother-in-law. Teresa, who planned to enjoy her college life, lost all motivation to study and lazes around at home every day. My mother-in-law, doing no housework, joins Teresa in mocking Paul for his low salary, leading to constant quarrels. Having secretly saved up money, I moved to a luxury high-rise condo and lived a busy life. I was worried about the backlash from other employees for a former regular employee becoming the president, but they welcomed me warmly. My contributions to hit products is who have played a significant role. Any gaps in my knowledge are covered by the executives. Free from worrying about Paul and Teresa's opinions, I'm glad to live freely. 
I plan to take care of myself while enriching both my work and personal life. A wife is supposed to be a supportive partner to her husband, but if she disobeys, it could lead to divorce. My husband James took my credit card and spent a lot of money while I was busy working. They were enjoying a vacation abroad, and I felt very disrespected. Angry and upset, I started thinking of a way to get back at him. My name is Karen Gillan, and I used to be a famous actress in the United States. I shone brightly in Hollywood, charming people all over the world, and making news internationally. My fame was huge. I stopped being in the spotlight when I married James, who used to manage my career. He took great care of everything for me, from my health to my personal life. Now, we run several fashion stores together. I stepped away from fame when I was 23, even though I was very popular at the time. This decision caused a lot of media attention and disappointed my fans, who begged me not to leave. There were a lot of rumors and stories in the newspapers. Despite all this, James and I married happily, and everyone supported us. Just before I retired, I started my own fashion brand, and now James works for me in finance while I lead our business. Life seemed perfect, but recently James has been acting odd. He seems tired and down all the time. I asked him if something was wrong at work, knowing he tends to keep his problems to himself. I often checked on James because he's not the type to talk about his problems. He waits for me to help him out. Even though it was a bit hard for me, I didn't mind because he had dealt with my difficult situations in the past. I always appreciated his help more than I got annoyed. One day, James suddenly said, I'm sick of just following your orders. His words surprised me. I had no idea he felt that way. James sometimes said harsh things when he was stressed from work. He tried to act strong there, so he probably felt he couldn't express his frustration anywhere else. I remembered how I used to snap at him when I was an actress, so I could understand his feelings. But still, his words shocked me, and I found myself shaking. I've been holding back. Karen is always busy, and I'm just there to support her, he continued. Even though James earns well, he's still an employee at our company, and I earn more than him. But I never thought that who earns more should matter in our marriage. His complaints really threw me off. Even when you come home, you're all about work. When we go shopping, you just buy whatever you want. How do you think that makes me feel? He said. Despite how things looked, he'd been very patient. Why can't you be more considerate? He asked, looking unhappy. Honestly, his words annoyed me. Our home is mostly supported by my income. His salary is for him to enjoy, and I've always seen that as my way of thanking him for all he has done and supported me with. There were times when he financially supported me when we had less. I wanted to make it up to him for all the personal time he gave up for me until I retired. It hurt to hear him sound so ungrateful. The things I buy are from the savings I manage. If anyone is making sacrifices, it's me. This thought made me angry. Karen, you're too free. I want more time off and to travel leisurely, James said. The salary's good since joining the company, but there's just no time. I left showbiz and joined your company to support you, Karen. Don't I deserve more gratitude? Stop putting your own time first and give me a break. When I retired from showbiz, James continued working as a manager. But once my business started doing well, he wanted to work with me. He said, If I join the company and stay by your side, Karen, you won't be lonely. I want to be there for you. I wanted to spend time with him, so I let him join. I never asked him to, so I don't understand why he's treating me like this now. Is this life not enough for him? Isn't he being too selfish? While I was thinking this, James made a request that felt like he was adding insult to injury. He said, My parents' 62 birthday is coming up. Can I take three weeks off to celebrate? I want to take them on a trip to Australia. They've never been, and I want to show them the tasty food and beautiful sights. I was surprised by his request and felt something was off. 
Asking for three weeks off is a small thing that he could easily have done at work without making a fuss. Our company is fair and no one would mind if someone took leave. Yet he chose to make it a big deal and negotiate directly with me. I felt something wasn't right, but these were just suspicions, nothing solid. Trying to keep my cool, I answered, I'm okay with that, but I can't make it this year. There's a crucial fashion show for my models, and I need to prepare for the London collection. My schedule just doesn't allow it. Can you ask if next year would work? I can adjust my schedule then. As a daughter-in-law, I'm expected to attend my in-law's 62 birthday celebration. However, our company has two big events this year, leaving no room for personal travel. I tried to negotiate a different date, but James refused with a smile, saying, It's fine, we'll just celebrate with my side of the family. I want to spend some quality family time. Being the accountant, my absence for a week won't really disrupt work, right? James's words about wanting to spend time just with his family really hurt me. He suggested that I was a nuisance, and that cut deep. So, how about it? I deserve some free time too, right? James often speaks without thinking. He's not mean, just sometimes careless. That's one of his faults, but I chose him as my life partner, knowing no one is perfect. However, I can't accept how he's speaking to me now, even if he doesn't mean it. Why do I have to be spoken to like this? Doesn't he care about me? Hey Karen, are you listening to me? I owe a lot to James's parents. Though I can't often visit because of work, they always treat me like their own child and praise my work. We're so happy to have such a wonderful daughter, his mother said when I married into the family, and his father celebrated our marriage with joy. It's their 62 celebration, and I understand wanting to celebrate it this year, but how can I agree happily after being spoken to like that? It doesn't matter to me. Take one week or two. Do as you like. I couldn't hold back my anger and showed it openly. This probably upset James. He stood up, visibly upset, and left the living room without a word. We've been sleeping in separate bedrooms because of work, and from that day until his trip, we didn't see each other at all. Is that really true? Isn't your husband being too harsh? My secretary, noticing my unusual demeanor, the day James left for his trip, pressed me for details. She's an exceptional talent and has been supporting me since I started managing the company. As women, we often see eye to eye, and sometimes she's even more reliable than my husband. She's quick-witted yet caring, always there to support me when I'm down or about to make a mistake. I think of her like family. She looks up to me like a real sister, and I often share my thoughts with her. Her advice is wise beyond her years and always helpful. This time, she noticed something was wrong and kindly asked me about it. At first, I hesitated to open up, but then I realized that keeping it in could affect my work. I decided to tell her everything that had happened up to today. She looked really angry when I told her. If I were you, I'd have given him a piece of my mind. You've been too soft on your husband, boss. I did that you love him, but you can't let him walk all over you, she said. Her straightforward advice really hit me. In an environment where everyone usually hesitates to speak up, she's the only one who treats me as an equal. I truly value this openness and comfort. Being in a higher position often means showing more humility and restraint, and having someone who can confront me directly like she does is really precious. You're right. What should I do? I asked her. You can call him, right? Why not talk afterward today? Don't worry about spoiling his trip. If things keep going like this, you might be headed for divorce, she continued, pressing the point like an older sister. I had no choice but to agree with her suggestion. I decided to call him right after work. He's in Australia, and there's about a 14-hour time difference from the U.S. For example, if it's 6 o'clock p.m. here, it's 8 o'clock a.m. there, about the time they would finish their breakfast. I had sent him an email in advance to let him know I needed to talk, so he should be expecting my call. I called thinking he'd surely answer, 
but he didn't pick up. Maybe he's still enjoying himself with everyone. I'll try calling again later. I tried calling every 50 minutes, but still no answer. Worried, I contacted my mother-in-law to check on him. Hello, Karen. You must be tired. I'm sorry we went on this trip without you. We told James we'd prefer you'd be with us, but he insisted. I knew from James that his mother used to be a strict teacher, but now she's much gentler and always cares about how busy I am. Never mind, we're so busy at the company this year I couldn't make time. I'll definitely make it up to you next year, okay? Oh, don't worry about it, she replied kindly. Just having this wonderful trip as a gift from you is more than enough for us. Her words, warm like a smile, seemed strange to me. Wait, a gift? I asked, confused by the term. She seemed surprised by my question. Oh, isn't it? James told us this trip was fully paid for by you since you couldn't join. I couldn't help but shout in surprise over the phone. Realizing I didn't know anything from my reaction, my mother-in-law quickly explained, Isn't this the trip Karen arranged? James paid for everything with Karen card, so I thought it was from you. The trip included James's parents and his sister's family, six people in total. The flight alone cost about $2,000 per person minimum, and with other expenses, it easily exceeded $22,000. It's outrageous to use such a large amount without asking me, especially since I usually cover living expenses. James doesn't gamble or smoke, so his salary should be intact. He definitely earns enough to afford such expenses, yet he didn't. With him not answering my calls, my anger started to boil. Noticing my upset, my mother-in-law spoke with concern. Karen, are you okay? We'll pay back every penny. James insisted on covering everything, which seemed odd. My husband and I decided to pay you back later. We miss you and plan to visit you. Thinking the trip was based on a terrible plan, she continued to comfort me. You're not at fault. It's also your 62 celebration, so please use that money for your enjoyment. I'll definitely get James to pay for it, but could you tell me more about the trip's planning? I was trying to figure out what James was up to when I realized this trip must have been planned months ago without me knowing. At that moment, I started to doubt him. Then, my mother-in-law revealed a shocking fact. The trip was actually suggested by James's sister and her husband. Surprisingly, it was James's sister and her husband who always criticized me who initiated the trip. James's brother-in-law, an executive at a company competing with mine, looked down on me for being a female CEO. Because of his high pride, James never stood up to his sister. The sight of James showing respect to someone other than herself must have caught my sister-in-law's attention. Even though she has always controlled James, I couldn't stand the fact that she got offended by James just being slightly nice to someone else. With their strong sense of rivalry, my sister-in-law and her husband disliked me, and I always tried to avoid them as much as possible. This couple, always competitive and disliking me, possibly planned this trip to create a rift and exclude me, using James as their source of money. I'm so sorry, I didn't know anything. James told me you were busy and asked us not to contact you directly, my mother-in-law said. If my in-laws and I were to communicate, it would have exposed the plan and potentially caused a rift in our marriage. To prevent this, James had already advised his parents not to reach out to me because of my busy schedule. His words were absolute to them, they decided to follow his advice and planned to express their gratitude when they returned. Karen, did you give James a card or something? He was paying with a gold card I've never seen before, my father-in-law asked suddenly. He must have been listening in, given his urgent tone. His question confirmed my suspicions the moment he mentioned the gold card. I checked my safe and found that the gold card he mentioned was missing. This card is crucial for our company and only James and I knew the safe's password. I never thought James would steal from the company, but it was clear he had taken the card. As the finance manager, he could easily change the records. 
Realizing he was misusing company funds, my anger grew, and I told my in-laws what had happened. They turned pale with shock. What should we do? Are we part of this theft? We'll go back with James immediately. We're as guilty as he is, even if we didn't know, my mother-in-law panicked. My father-in-law, who always takes his responsibilities seriously, agreed, we'll accept our punishment once we're back. I shook my head, disagreeing. No need for that. You were just tricked by James. You're not at fault. But I can't let James and his sister's family get away with this. We don't need punishment. But could you help me with something? I continued. I ignored James' actions until now, and that's my fault. He's taken me for granted, thinking he can just apologize and get away with it. This isn't just a personal problem. It's about the company. We need to teach him a lesson. All right, we'll do whatever we can to help, they responded. So we began planning how to get back at James. I was surprised by my own cleverness, but my love for James had turned into hatred and anger. Initially, my in-laws were hesitant about this harsh plan, but as parents, they finally decided to stand by me. Just as we were discussing this, James unexpectedly called. I ended the call with my in-laws and picked up James's call. What's up? We're enjoying a family-only trip, so what's this important talk about? James's sarcastic tone irritated me even more. You took your time calling. Did you go a little wild, huh? No way, just having drinks at a nearby bar with mom and dad. This confirmed he was lying. I had just spoken to his parents, and there was no noisy bar sound in the background. Besides, they had no reason to lie to me. He was probably out causing trouble with his sister's family. His words cooled my feelings for him completely. Oh really? By the way, James, you haven't been messing with the company's expenses, have you? His attitude changed instantly at my unexpected question. What's that all about? His tone, usually lighthearted, turned dead serious. Was this his true nature? Seeing his attitude shift as if he now saw me as an enemy, I faced him with equal firmness. Just checking since there will be an audit at the company soon. Are you suspecting me? His defensive reaction showed his guilt. I couldn't help but laugh at his poor response. What's wrong? I was just concerned and you're talking about suspicion. Did you do something wrong? No, anyway the house isn't in a mess when I get back, right? Realizing he was digging himself deeper, he suddenly changed the subject. His actions only made him look more suspicious. I was almost impressed by his foolishness. Who knows? I've been busy with work too. Give me a break. I hate coming back to a dirty house with bugs. A wife is her husband's maid, disobey, and it's divorce. Even our executive says that to his wife. Looks like I might have to do the same, right? You wouldn't want that, so keep the house clean. I had never seen him getting along with the executive. His current words were probably all his own thoughts. But aware of his weaker position, he used the third person to express them. His patheticness made me sigh. Sure, I'll keep that in mind. There was no need to talk to him any longer. James clearly looked down on me, even embezzling company funds. Embezzlement is a serious crime, and I could take him to the police. No mercy even for a spouse, but that alone wouldn't satisfy me after ending the call with James. The next day, while I was busy preparing for the fashion show, I made a phone call to a certain place. Of course, James bombarded me with calls. I noticed his calls late at night while I was out. Luckily, my secretary was driving, so I answered James's call on speaker. You're late, what have you been doing? His voice was rougher than I'd ever heard, surprising both my secretary and me. What do you mean? I was working. Did you do something yesterday? Do something like what? Don't play dumb? Tell me the truth. James was in complete panic, and in the background, I could hear several Australia men and my sister-in-law and her husband confronting him. It sounded noisy. Something wrong? I asked. No, it's just a... James, who had been blustering, suddenly began to stammer. He realized that admitting anything would put him in a very disadvantageous position. 
His odd behavior made me explain to him what was coming. Too bad, James, you were supposed to be having a blast in Australia. But it seems your dream turned into a nightmare overnight, huh? But it's what you deserve for misusing someone else's money. You did something, didn't you? As he reacted weirdly, I revealed what I had done the day before. I had contacted the president of the credit card company I was contracted with. Despite it being after hours, he agreed to help me due to our long-standing relationship. He immediately suspended the company's credit card. If a credit card is misused, the company doesn't have to pay the store, leaving the store at a loss. However, James had arranged to pay the entire bill at checkout. So with the card blocked, he couldn't pay and was now being interrogated by the hotel receptionists. James, mom and dad have already checked out. The taxi I reserved for them has left with them, so there's no one coming to pick you up, I said. My sister-in-law, who was cornered, bombarded James, asking what to do next. Hearing this, James panicked even more and directed his anger at me. How can you do this and think it's okay? Are you ready for a divorce? Go ahead. I'd rather not have a husband who steals from the company. I've already talked to a lawyer, and we're starting the divorce process, I told James. He was clearly shaken by my calm reaction. I've ignored so much of what you've done, James. There was a time when you supported my work and I was grateful, but I've reached my limit. My patience is gone, I continued. That can't be. James realized he was in a real crisis and let out a desperate cry. The receptionist kept demanding payment from James and his group, who were now trapped in despair. None of them spoke Australia and were relying on a guide to communicate. Hearing their situation, I suggested switching the call to me. No one there speaks Australia, right? Let me talk to them for you. You're going to help? James sounded relieved, thinking I had changed my mind. Without hesitation, he handed his phone to them. I spoke to the receptionists in Australia, explained the situation, and they understood quickly and seemed cooperative. To ease their worries, I also gave them my contact information, which my secretary noted down. After a friendly chat, they returned the phone to James. What happened? Did you sort it out? James asked. Yes, I've taken care of it. Now it's up to you guys. Really? You're a lifesaver, Karen. I love you, he said, then hurried off, apparently called by the receptionists. James, clueless, ended the call and followed them. Are you sure about this? It probably won't end well, my secretary asked. Perfect, right? It's ideal for them to see hell, I responded. An hour later, as expected, I received a barrage of calls again from James. When I answered the call, James was on the line, his voice full of distress. Karen, what's going on here? What is this place? He cried out and showed me through a video call the image of a slum area in Sydney, Australia. James and his sister's family were there, looking miserable and stripped of their belongings. They had been taken to what's considered the most dangerous place in Australia, which was completely unexpected. When I was talking to the receptionist earlier, he had mentioned he was a big fan and promised to arrange a severe punishment, but I never thought he meant this place. I couldn't help but laugh at their predicament. Lucky you're still alive in Australia most dangerous place. It's a miracle, really. What? Wait, Karen, what's this about? Explain yourself and come help us right now. James pleaded. Since it was a video call, they could probably hear everything clearly. Behind them, many homeless people were surrounding James and his group, causing chaos. You guys were causing trouble for Karen. You reap what you sow. Time for reflection, added my in-laws, joining the call unexpectedly. Mom, Dad, what are you doing? James was shocked. A friend of Karen flew us back in a private jet. We returned to the U.S. and Karen picked us up. We realized you were trying to set Karen up. We asked her to do as she pleases with you guys, they explained. As they said this, the onlookers behind them started confronting James's sister and her husband. The people living in this rough area were ruthless. If you wore anything valuable, even women were not spared. 
They raise their voices while on the video call. In such a dangerous neighborhood, it's no surprise they became perfect targets. I addressed the crowd in Australia, loud enough for them to hear, telling them these men had been using my card illegally and had treated me horribly. I encouraged the locals to do as they pleased with James and his group, and they eagerly agreed to give them a hard time. Suddenly, the call ended probably because someone snatched the phone. After that, James and his group were stuck living in the harsh conditions of the slum, treated poorly by the locals. Without money to return to the U.S., they were essentially trapped abroad. I later confirmed with the hotel receptionist that an acquaintance of his, who was a leader in that slum, had agreed to look after James and his group. In return for his help, I promised to treat him to some good liquor the next time and assured him not to worry. They made a deal to keep James and his group safe from life-threatening situations. In return, I agreed to perform at that hotel, something I hadn't done in a long time. The receptionist mentioned that a live performance video of mine, the only one I ever released, was still his treasure. He invited me to stay at their hotel and sing for them, promising VIP treatment. Following this, I successfully got my revenge on James and his group with the help of the men from the hotel. I also managed to divorce James. I felt refreshed and have been enjoying life with my in-laws. James's sister and her husband were fired from their jobs for unexcused absences. Their phones were taken by the locals, leaving them without a way to contact anyone. My in-laws explained the situation well, so it didn't become a police matter, and no one seemed to care about them. Thus, my ties with James were completely severed. Since then, I've been focusing on work and living a happy life. Occasionally, I call the receptionist to check on James and his group. They're still living in tough conditions, but I don't feel sorry for them. I asked to spare their lives, and now I'm enjoying my life to the fullest.